have not heard, TWI starts on March 8th and CAUTA starts on March 15th. You can check both of those out online at leanfrontiers.com under the summits tab. Now with that, I would like to introduce our facilitator for today, Daniel Matthews. Daniel is a change leadership expert, author, speaker, and owner of Continue to Improve. For more than three decades, he's worked with businesses and individuals to embrace the change that never stops with less stress and more success. He is one of the original creators of TMMK's Problem Solving Curriculum, a TWI Master Trainer and Leadership Coach. He is the author of the A3 Workbook, Unlock Your Problem Solving Mind and the Language of Leadership. Nicer bark, no bite. With that, I will hand it over to him. Thank you, Skylar. Appreciate it. So in today's session, we're going to quickly talk about how most people perceive problems we're going to look at the evolution of the Toyota problem solving TBP process or how it started out and how it evolved to TBP. We're going to look at the mechanics of TBP and the mistakes most problem solvers make and hopefully what you can do to avoid those. The role of divergent and convergent thinking in Toyota's problem solving process. And one of the things I think that's, that's really important is how Toyota shortened the problem solving culture curve. So those are the things we're going to cover today. Now, I want to start by showing you this very brief video. It's about two minutes long. And at the end of it, there's a question that says, what is the problem? So I want you to take a second as you watch this and then commit to writing down your answer, because I'm going to show you what most people or how most people respond to this. So here we go. Orchard Case Part A. Meet John. He works nine to five at a body shop during the week. But in the evenings and on weekends, he tends his orchard with 100 apple trees. Generally, 75% of his apples are good enough to sell each fall, bringing in an extra 4,000 to 6,000 per year. The extra money made it possible for him to put his oldest son and daughter through college and will be even more important when his youngest daughter starts college in the fall. John's orchard lies in the northern end of his property and takes up nearly two thirds of the total acreage. He has a work shed at the southwestern edge of his orchard. A state road marks the western and northern boundaries of John's property and Elkhorn Creek runs west to east through his orchard. The property to the west of John's is owned by his twin brother, Sam. Sam also has an apple orchard that he tends in his spare time and the two of them have a friendly competition about who grows the best apples. Just yesterday, John and Sam were talking outside John's work shed when Sam noticed that a large area of grass around the shed had turned yellow and dry. Sam kidded John about it saying, seems odd that you can grow apples but you can't manage to keep a little grass from dying in a year with normal rainfall. John ignored Sam's comment and they started to walk towards the orchard. John pulled up short as he approached the first apple tree. Lying on the ground underneath the first tree were several dozen small green unripe apples. Well, I guess I was wrong, Sam said. Looks like you can't grow apples either. Unless you do something about it, bro, it looks like I'm going to be the apple king this year. The next day, John went out again to check his apple trees. More unripe apples had fallen off that first tree. Even worse, unripe apples had fallen off two other trees nearby. What is the problem? All right, so you should hopefully have a PDF in front of you and at the very top it asks you that same question. So just take a second and write that down. This is actually an assessment that we used at the very beginning of our 16 hour problem solving class at TMMK. Uh, many years ago, and it's something that I still use today. Now, when we look at the responses most people provide to this, this is a list of the most common ones. Things like shed, shades three trees, not enough water. Uh, sometimes they get into countermeasures like uh, we should move the trees. And sometimes they even say there's no problem at all. When we look at the data over the last 20 years, this is how it really hands out. 
about 4% of the people actually pick up on the real problem, whereas 73% of people look at possible causes and a little over 7.5% actually list a countermeasure and just under 4% say there's no problem at all. And then 11% or 11.5% of people come up with something else that's not one of those four items. So when we talked about what a problem is at Toyota, we said it's fairly simple. It's the difference between the standard and the current situation. And in this case, what we had to do is we had to look at what John normally saw from day to day, year to year. And in this case, what he saw was small unripe apples staying on 100 apple trees. And his current situation was that small unripe apples were staying on 97 of the apple trees, making the problem small unripe apples falling off of three trees. Again, most people don't pick up the problem. They immediately go to a cause or countermeasure. And that's because I think we've been trained over the years that we need to do something when we sense or feel there's a problem. And the problem with that is that we normally miss the mark. The next thing is the extent. Uh, and in this case, the extent of the problem was just the three trees nearest the shed. Now, when we think about Toyota and, and their problem solving, you know, we, we hear it called A3 problem solving. We hear it called A3 thinking. Well, we never really called it any of that. Our very first iteration of the Toyota problem solving process at TMMK was in 1988, and we just called it Introduction to Problem Solving. And you can see a copy of a typical A3 that was produced as a result of that class. It's mostly text-based and just a simple line graph. Then in 1990, we came up with the, the second phase of this, which was problem-solving QC tools. And so we introduced them to line graphs, check sheets, Pareto diagrams, and fishbone diagrams. And the fish, fishbone diagrams were not used as brainstorming tools. They were a way for us to take this very complicated problem and display all the various causal chains with root causes in one area so that everybody could see that easily. The other thing that uh, in 1988, or, or with the introduction to uh, Toyota problem solving, uh, the second phase of that was to actually go to our tier one suppliers and teach that same class to them and actually do train the trainers so that when we tracked a problem back to the supplier, they understood our problem solving methodologies and our way of communicating through the A3. So that was one of the things that I think that, that made things go so smoothly back in the early days. And then of course, Today, uh, it started in 2004 in Japan. They, they tweaked the problem solving process and they called it Toyota Business Practice, eight step problem solving. And I really think that's probably the best definition of what Toyota's problem solving is. It's, it's a business practice. It really is the foundation of everything they do. Now, this is the typical A3 that I use with my clients. And as you can see up here, we keep sort of that funnel shape as we break down the problem. We just try to keep it more like a flow chart. And then on the other side where we, where we would create the plan and, and do a summary and, and reflection, it's basically text-based. So over the years, this is what the Toyota problem solving process evolved to. And as you can see, most of the changes were in the plan phase where in the QC tools, we looked at locating and pinpointing the problem that was a, a a tool that we used was the Pareto diagram. And then in 2004, when they went to the eight step problem solving, instead of calling it locate problem and pinpoint problem, they just called it break down the problem. And all the rest of the steps are pretty much the same with the exception of in the eight step uh, under do check and act, they only have one bullet statement, whereas we had more bullet statements. Those are all things that are covered across the board, regardless of whether it was intro to problem solving or TBP eight step. All those steps are still covered. It's just that they abbreviated the steps in the description. So once you've, once you've figured out what the problem is that you wanna focus on, it's really important that you break this down. And that's one thing that most people don't do is they don't take the time to break the problem down properly. So in this case, we're gonna look at a case study that we had at Toyota and it was all about water leaks. 
And so we're gonna break down water leaks in this next section. And the whole idea is that we wanna go from vague to specific. So you start with your, your Hoshin, which is at your executive level. In this case, the, the basic focus or primary focus is to maintain and improve quality. And then you've got your management, which create their own department plans based on the overall focus of the Hoshin. And if we're focusing on body weld in this case, we wanna look at our in-process defect rate. At that highest level, the accumulated total is 0 0.0198. And when we move down to the group leaders and, and specifically body weld group two on the left side, uh, their in-process defect rate is 0 0.006. And then when we get down to the team leader level, and this is really where problem solving really begins because the more specific and the more focused you can get, the more success you'll have as you go through the problem solving process. So in this case, the defect rate is uh, 0.0015 and water leaks take up a 10, 10 thousandths of that as, uh, as the total number. Now, the next part is, is really important. A lot of people will stop with just identifying the problem, in this case, water leaks at 10, 10 thousandths. But at Toyota, it was really important for us, whether it was in introduction to problem solving or QC tools or TVP, to break that problem down even further. So when we break the problem down, one of the things that we did in this case is we looked at the part. So where were the water leaks? Well, specifically the ones we're gonna focus on were in the quarter panel. And where on the quarter panel were they? They were in area B. And as you can see in the quarter panel, they were nine ten thousandths. When we just focus on quarter panel area B, we're down to five ten thousandths. And then when we look at the type of defect that we were really gonna focus on in area B, it was sealant deficiency, and that takes us down to four ten thousandths. So as you can see, we went from a very vague problem of 0 0.0198 down to focusing on just point uh, or four ten thousandths. And this, might, this is what it actually looks like. So if, if you're thinking about group, uh, group two and all the team leaders there, these are all the, the parts they deal with and, and all the defects they had. And it created uh, 25 variables that they had to sort through and a total of 62 total defects. So we're talking about a lot of variables and a lot of defects. But when you put it through the process of breaking that problem down and you focus in this case on team two, we're looking at water leaks. We're looking at water leaks in the quarter panel, area B of the quarter panel, sealant deficiency type. And that took us from 25 to three variables. So a big difference. It also reduced the number of defects we were looking at from 62 to just four. So when you have a very laser-like focus like this, it makes it much easier to go through cause analysis. Now, once we know exactly what the problem is and what the characteristics are, we really need to take time to track back. And this is really the key to successful cause analysis is finding out that point of cause for the problem. So typically what we do is we identify the point of discovery in, in where we first notice this issue or problem. And then what we wanna do is we wanna track back through all the processes until we get to a point where we don't see the problem, like in process two, then we circle back to the last place that we saw the problem, in this case, process three. And that becomes our point of cause. And that's where cause analysis begins. But before we get into cause analysis, the next step in the process of TBP eight step is to set the target. And one of the most important things that I think people need to understand is if you do the work up front then it makes it so much easier when you go to the next step. So for instance, if we're talking about the target in this particular A3, first let's look over here. You can see that this is the gap plus the breakdown plus track back. This is the description of the problem that we're focusing on. And that becomes part of the target. So when we think about the target, there are four parts, the problem, the due to, the how much, and by when. The problem is simply water leaks in this case, but we need some sort of description about what we want to do with those water leaks. And so I use the acronym DIE, D-I-E, and that's because we want our problems to die and go away. D stands for decrease, 
I stands for improve and E stands for eliminate. So depending on what you're trying to do, you're either going to decrease, you're going to improve, or you're going to eliminate altogether. And that brings us to the second part, which is due to. In this case, these are the characteristics of the problem that we identified through breaking it down and going to the point of cause. So we want to decrease water leaks due to sealant deficiencies on left side quarter panel, area B at process three. And that becomes a description of our problem. Now, again, if you've done all the work properly, it really helps you in that very next step. So the next thing that happens is this is where we write our theme. The theme comes from the target. It's based on the problem and the due to section of the target. And the great thing about this is, is it's very descriptive. So somebody can pick this up and immediately know what they're going to be reading about in this report. The other thing is, is, is if, you, if you create a log or a virtual or a, a, a digital log of all your A3s, you can add keywords into the search and you can find A3s or other A3s that may be similar to what you're dealing with now so that you can go back and talk to the, the people that actually wrote the report and some of the other stakeholders. So that's one of the key things about creating the theme and where the theme comes from. The next thing is that if you notice here, the standard is five ten thousandths, but the defect rate is 10 ten thousandths. But what we're focusing on is only going to bring us down to six ten thousandths, which means we're going to be one ten thousandth short of the standard. And some people are thinking, well, maybe that's that's not right, but it's it's OK. And I'll explain why in this next slide. It'll become obvious. So that leaves us with the date. And that's something that you'll get better at. The more problem solving you do, the easier it will become for you to decide what date to put on there to have this completed by. You'll, your experience will help you with that. Now, some people will say, well, it's okay if we go back and change that. And that's something I really don't, don't tell my clients they can do. And the reason is when we make a projection, whether it's in the target or in our, in our countermeasures implementation plan, if we don't meet that projection, it's okay because that's a, that's a place where we can learn. And I remember my very first Hoshin department review when I was at the forklift company in Columbus, Indiana. My department plan looked really good, had lots of circles and double circles on it, only one big red X. And at the end of my presentation, the executives only focused on that one red X. And later on, when I asked my coordinator why they were so focused on that. He said, Danielson, he said, he said, X is not bad. X is, X is good. He says, this is opportunity to learn. So when you think about creating a projection and missing that projection, it's an opportunity to learn. And I tell my clients failure, the word failure, or what we normally call the word failure is not a word at all. It's an acronym and it stands for finding answers in life using reflective evaluation. So anytime you miss a projection, this is an opportunity to reflect and evaluate on that and learn from it so that next time you don't run into that same issue. So when I said we would, we would talk about why it was okay that the, the target didn't meet the standard, this is exactly why, because little and often make a lot. So for instance, if, if you're working, if you're a team leader and you have team members that have been trained in problem solving, you can delegate different aspects of the problem to each of your team members. And as they go through the process of solving the problem, they're going to be able to hit their targets, which in turn will or can make it possible for you to be below the actual standard. So at, at that point, you've actually achieved a new standard and can go from that point forward. Now, that brings us to root cause analysis. And root cause analysis is really all about creating a series of causal links that lead you from a very precise description of the problem to the root cause. Now, here's some of the mistakes that, that people make when we talk about root cause analysis. First of all, we've, we've talked about the importance of, of taking that large vague problem and narrowing it down to some very specific characteristics and then finding the point of cause and asking why. Well, many people don't do that and they start asking why at the large vague problem. And the problem with that is there are so many different variables that they inevitably miss the boat and they don't achieve what they're trying to achieve. I remember one time at one client where 
uh, we had the day before talked about cause analysis and they were to go back to their teams and explain the cause analysis process to their, their people and then work on cause analysis for the problem they had picked up. Well, the next day when, when they came back, one of the managers said, you know, uh, they didn't like that at all because they said it was too narrow. We needed to broaden the focus because it, it didn't make sense to use a fishbone diagram on something so focused. And, and the problem is, is that they were a Six Sigma organization or an organization that really relied on Six Sigma problem solving to deal with all their issues. Not that Six Sigma is an issue, but it's for much larger problems, not for smaller problems. And they were accustomed to using fishbone diagrams. And as we were having this conversation, one of the managers says, well, we are told that we have to do one Six Sigma project a quarter, a total of four for the year. But he went on to say that because it's so complicated and we have so much to do and we have so little time, most of the time we end up pencil whipping it. So even though it's a good process, if you're not, if you're not following that process and you're not doing it properly, you're not going to get the results you need. Plus, you also need to use the right tool for the right job. And most problems, more than 99% of problems, can be solved with a simpler uh, problem-solving process like PDCA and Toyota's TBP eight-step problem-solving process. So when we think of cause analysis, cause analysis begins at the point of cause. So we take that large, vague problem, we break it down, we find the point of cause, and then we go through why, 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 until we eventually get to the root cause. Now, the second mistake is that when they have a description of the problem, in this case, a whistling noise in the left-hand corner of windshields, they go through the process of brainstorming some potential causes, just like they have in this example, where the gasket around the windshield is crimped, uh, pinholes and welds around the, the windshield, sealer applied unevenly, and windshield frame out of alignment. But what I've seen over and over again when I go to team leader boards and I look at the problem solving section and I look at cause analysis, cause analysis specifically, this is what I see. They take those potential causes that are at the same level and they try to arrange them into a 5Y that makes sense to them. And so this is basically what they try to do. And if you look at this, gasket around windshield crimp during installation could explain why there's a whistling noise. But pinholes in the welds around the frame does not explain why the windshield gasket was crimped. And sealer not applied or, or sealer applied unevenly leaving gaps does not explain why there are pinholes. So believe it or not, this is something that I see many times when I go to an organization and I look at their team leader boards and their cause analysis. So this is not true root cause analysis. This is just taking brainstorm potential causes that haven't been verified yet and trying to organize them into some sort of five wide chain. So what does true root cause analysis look like? Well, we start with the same problem, but it's all about going to the Gemba and asking a very specific question. And that question is, in this case, why do we have a whistling noise in the left-hand corner of windshields on 25% of these vehicles? Well, we have our potential causes here. Now we have to go to the Gemba and we need to research each one of these. So for instance, 100% uh, of windshield frames are laser measured and verified before leaving body weld. We've gone out there, we've watched the process, we see the data, and we can confirm that that's true. So that is not a cause of this problem. There was a pinhole problem a few weeks ago, but uh, it, was, it was due to too high a temperature on a particular robot. And they fixed that problem. And we've gone out there and we've looked again and, and we don't see those same issues with the robots that are welding uh, the frame around the windshield. Sealer reports indicate sealer on uh, all vehicles is, is complete and even. So we put a question mark here. And the reason we put a question mark here is because the sealer reports indicate it. Reading a report is not good enough. You need to go out and look for yourself firsthand. So a report can give us information that somebody wrote down, but it can't really tell us what's going on at the process. And then the last one is windshield gaskets checked in assembly and one out of four are bunched up at the left-hand corner. So we know that the, the gaskets are bunching up in the left-hand corner. Now the idea is that we're, we're there, we're looking at, at this, and we need to uh, 
analyze it further. And so we asked, why would the gasket be bunching up? And we go through that process. We brainstorm potential causes. We go back and we investigate each of those. And then we continue that process back and forth, back and forth until we eventually get to the root cause. And it might look something like this. Uh, whistling noise on 25% of the vehicles, why gasket bunches up around left-hand corner, why gasket stretches as it is pushed into place, why team member having to force gasket into place, why team member not applying lubricant to gasket, why team member ran out of lubricant, why lubricant Kanban not submitted, and team member not trained on Kanban usage, why trainer did not use training checklist. So that's the root cause. The trainer did not use the checklist when he was doing the training and he missed some very, very valuable or important information. When I teach TWI job instruction, I talk about three areas of training that you need to focus on. There's the core job, there's the peripheral tasks, and there are uh, the procedural tasks. In this case, what team members need to do with that Kanban is a procedural task and they need to be taught how to use the Kanban. In this case, they weren't taught that so they did not know how to go about getting the lubricant they needed in order to make sure they didn't create problems down the road. Here's another example of causal chain. This one has to do with a dealership uh, check-in the, in the service department. 65% of the people experience uh, below uh, expectation customer service. Why? The check-in lanes are, are long and backed up. Why? The staff spends too much time with each customer. Why? Staff have difficult time finding custom, customer information in the system. Ask me how I know because it's happened to me many times. And then why incorrect customer information in the system? Why Re records don't update regularly? Why there's no set guidelines for updating customer information? So these are two examples of cause analysis and what cause analysis looks like. Now, when we think about cause analysis, generally, root causes fall into one of three categories. Either they lack a standard process, they're not following a standard process, or they have an inaccurate or poorly defined standard. Those are the three basic categories root causes fall into. And when we, when we look at the long wait times, uh, there was a lack of a standard. There was no information about, um, there's no information for them or, or standard for them to update the customer information. And when we look at the whistling noise, it was not following a standard. There was a standard that the team leader should have been using the checklist, but they did not. And that's why the problem happened. So that brings us to the next part of the eight step problem solving process, which is countermeasures, which are long term and short term. And again, one of the things that's really important about this process, if you've done the work beforehand, this step is easy. So if you've done your work in cause analysis and you have a good, strong causal chain, it makes brainstorming countermeasures much easier. So when we look at this example, for instance, uh, sinus headaches every spring and fall in Kentucky. Why increased sinus pressure? Why nasal passage is inflamed? Why nasal passage irritated due to allergies? And why inhaling too much pollen? And then the root cause, Kentucky has high pollen count in spring, fall, due to lush, lush vegetation. So when you look at your causal chain, if you draw a line between the root cause and all the previous lines, everything above the root cause are items that you can brainstorm for short-term countermeasures. Short-term countermeasures are things that you can do to get you by until you can eliminate the root cause of the problem. In this case, for the first three lines, I could take a pain relieving analgesic and that should uh, take care of the symptoms that I have. But uh, once it wears off, I'm going to be back right, right back where I started. And then if I'm outside mowing the grass or doing yard work, I can wear a mask and that will help. It won't eliminate it completely, but it will reduce the impact. So ultimately what I need to do is I need to move back to the desert where I grew up, where we have very little vegetation and, and the pollen count is much lower. So when you think about root cause analysis, it's, or it's, it's about identifying obviously the root cause so that you can get rid of the problem and prevent reoccurrence. But it also gives you an opportunity to find some good short-term countermeasures that you can put in place so that you can uh, eventually 
get the long-term countermeasure in place and eliminate the cause of the problem. Which brings us to Nemawashi. Now that you have your countermeasures, you're creating your implementation plan. Nemawashi is what I call the meeting before the meeting. And you've probably been in meetings before where you've been told something and it, it didn't quite agree with you. And after the meeting, people leave and they go and they break up into little groups or cliques and they start talking about what went on in the meeting and what they didn't like about the meeting. And it, it really brings morale down. And it also uh, makes it less effective when you go to implement the countermeasure or whatever it was that was discussed in the meeting. And so Nemawashi is really about building consensus one-on-one -on -one, uh, before getting a uh, formal approval later on down the road. Now, I call this because most of my clients don't really know what Nemawashi is. I call it the goldfish principle. And if you've ever bought a goldfish or any kind of fish from a pet store and taken it home and wanted to put it in your fish tank, one of the things they tell you to do is to float the bag in the water or in the tank. And the reason is, is you want to bring the water in the bag to the same temperature as the water in the tank so that the fish doesn't get shocked as much. So when we think about floating the bag and we, we talk about uh, TBP and, and problem solving, it's where you take the A3 that you have completed to the implementation plan and you distribute that to all the stakeholders and let them read through it and think about it before you actually meet with them. And the reason is, is because when most people are confronted with some sort of change, they, they see it as a negative and it takes them some time to warm up to it. So if you give them the A3 in advance, let them read through it, then they can at least begin to warm up to the idea and then start thinking of, ways to modify or improve the implementation plan so that it's, it's not such a shock to their system. So then once you've done that, then you can schedule those one-on-one -on -one meetings and talk about the, the A3 and the implementation plan. And these are the questions that you should be asking. First of all, does the proposal make sense to you? And if it does, great. If it doesn't, you need to understand what doesn't make sense to them. And then does the proposal fit in with your goals and objectives? If not, how can we do that? And what are your thoughts about it? Get their input about how they think uh, this idea can be better and it could be more smoothly rolled out. When you think about a goldfish, when you, once, you've, once you've warmed that water up in there, one of the things that you do is you, you take a cup of water and you pour it in the bag and you wait 10 minutes. Then you take another cup of water from the tank and pour it in the bag and wait 10 minutes. And then you take another cup of water and pour it in the bag and wait 10 minutes. And by that time, the, the water in the bag is pretty much the same as the water in the tank. So not only has the fish warmed up to the idea, but the environment now is very similar to that of what the tank is. And that's the whole idea is you need, you need to, to have that support from all the stakeholders. And the only way to get that is to get their input about this. And then, then you wanna make sure that uh, you ask them specifically, if I make changes, if I make these changes, will I be able to count on your support? Because without their support, you've done all this work and it's probably not going to work out well. And then once you get that commitment and you've got that commitment from everyone else, you bring everyone together one final time and say, okay, are we all on board? Here's all the changes that I've made uh, based on your suggestions and ideas. And I think this is what's going to work. And then you implement it. Once you've implemented it, then it's time to look at the decision tree or what, what steps are you going to take next? And so we call this the if then. If the implementation plan failed, then we need to in initiate problem solving to identify root causes of the failed plan. So why did the plan fail? go back and look at those things so that you can countermeasure that and prevent it from being an issue in the future. If partially achieve the target, then repeat problem solving to identify other root causes and find new countermeasures. So you got close to the target you set, but you didn't quite reach it. So maybe there's some other things that you didn't notice or didn't see while you were out there at the Gemba. So go back and look at what the other root causes are. If 
the target was met, but the problem could reoccur, then you need to look at some additional long-term countermeasures to ensure that you do prevent reoccurrence. And then if the target was met and the problem will not reoccur, that's where we standardize and share our findings and, and pick up uh, new problems. And so those are the steps in the TBP eight-step problem solving process. When we think about the thinking process behind this, it's really all about divergent and convergent thinking. Uh, it's all about creating options when we think about divergent thinking. When we think about convergent thinking, it's about making decisions and narrowing our focus. So when we start with that large vague problem, what we're doing is we're using convergent thinking so that we can make some decisions. And the process is very simple. We identify the standard, the current situation and the gap. Then we break that down into specific characteristics until we eventually get to where we've identified the point of cause. Then we can set our target and then we can begin the process of cause analysis. Now, what's fun about cause analysis and, and the two types of thinking is that once you get to, the, to, to your uh, point of cause and your very specific characteristics, you have a very specific thing that you're looking at. But now you're gonna use divergent thinking to look at potential causes that could be creating this issue. And then you're gonna use convergent thinking at the Gemba to narrow that down. And you're gonna repeat that process over and over again until you eventually re reach the root cause of the problem. Then in step five, where we develop the countermeasures, it's divergent thinking again. It's all about creating options, brainstorming things that we can do in this situation. And again, if we've done a really good job with our causal chain, there are some keys in there that will help us uh, create some brainstorming points. Then once we've done that, then we need to do convergent thinking. We've created this big list of brainstorm countermeasures. Now we need to narrow that list using things like feasibility, effectiveness, and impact. And then we narrow that list even more by evaluating it using specific uh, criteria, and then use the select the best countermeasures based on that evaluation. And then we create a plan. So we do some more divergent thinking about expanding that so that we can create a plan that works and going through the Nimawashi process as well. And then we get to the process where we get our results then we evaluate that, use some convergent thinking to look at the results and the process so that we can ultimately standardize those successful processes. So when you think about problem solving, it is a series of divergent and convergent thinking that happens. So how did Toyota shorten the problem solving culture curve? Well, first of all, we started with a 16 hour intro to problem solving class and, and this class uh, was to help us teach everyone in the facility about the problem solving process. But it was also a way for us to uh, manage moving team members to team leaders. So we created a pre-promotion program that had several classes and one of which was the uh, problem solving or 16 hour problem solving class. And in that there were basically four phases we went through. We went through the, the first phase was kind of that assessment, which you saw the first of four parts at the beginning of this where we talked about the, the apple orchard. And that's to assess where team members are right now in their understanding of problem solving and the steps in the problem solving process in PDCA. Then we had a, a case study that was called Clog Nozzle. And this was one where we worked together, where the students read the case study. Then we facilitated the responses to that case study, uh, going back and forth using their, their thoughts and ideas and facilitating it on the board and having discussion. Then at the end of the class, we had another case study and that case study's purpose was to assess how well they had internalized the steps of the problem solving process. And then last but not least, one of the things they had to do is pick up a problem in their work site and work through the problem solving process over that two week period of time. And the very last day was spent going through their A3. So they distributed copies of their A3s to all the participants in the class. And then they presented it to the class, got feedback from participants as well as the instructor. Then uh, the next phase of that was after class practice. And, and the way they practiced was through quality circles, through suggestion system, and then 
identifying problems in their processes and using the, the problem solving process to solve those problems. And then the last part of that was when once they were promoted to team leader, there was a period of time where they had lots of opportunity to work on problems. And so to move from team leader to group leader, they also had pre-promotion and there were several classes they had to take. But at the end of those classes, one of the things they had to do is they had to take an assessment to see how well over the years they had internalized the problem solving process. Could they ask the right questions? Could they get to the right answers? Were they looking at the right types of things? Were they identifying the right problems based on the things they were taught in problem solving and the things that they had done in the work site? And that's how Toyota shortened their problem solving culture curve. And, and problem solving is the foundation of lean manufacturing. And there, there's no better example that I can think of than one of my clients uh, several years ago was someone who sprayed molten metal on the leading edges of aluminum aircraft parts. And we went there to do some 5S and they had on each workbench, a turntable like the one you see in the, the left-hand side of, of the slide. And it had all these different types of tape on it. And the tape was different sizes and uh, they used it for different things, different parts. And as you can see, there are multiple uh, rolls of tape that are the same size. And uh, you might even be able to tell that some of the tape is damaged. Now this tape is very expensive and they kept it in a cabinet and when they pulled it out of the cabinet, they had to sign off on it and they basically bought that tape. So even though they didn't need that tape or they weren't using that tape at that particular time, they had already bought it as a company. So during the 5S event, they decided they were going to create these pegboards and put them on the side of the workbenches so that they could easily see what type of tape they had, what tape they needed, and team leaders could go by and replenish it as they needed. Well, after I left, I came back six months later to do some sort of follow through with them. And what I noticed is most of the 5S that they had done had disappeared. There were remnants of 5S, just like with a lot of organizations who try to implement lean. When you go back six months or a year later, uh, you find that very little of it remains. And the reason is, is because they didn't have a problem solving mindset. And so what they ended up doing is the, the people were complaining that uh, the board was in their way. They couldn't talk to their neighbor as freely and easily as they could before. And so management says, OK, no problem. Uh, get rid of the boards and go back to the way things were before. Now, when I ask participants, if that's a good answer for a manager to give, you wouldn't believe how many people say, yes, that's a great answer. They're, they're thinking about the people and they care about the people, but they really don't. They, they don't care about the people as much as you might think. And they certainly are not thinking about the organization as a whole. What a good manager would have done would say, okay, well, we have this new way. What we need to do is look at the issues you're having with this and look at the benefits that this, this new way provides us and how we can maintain those new benefits and still give you what you need. So when we think about, when we think about uh, problem solving, it's not old way, new way. It's old way, new way, better way. We should never be going backwards. Once we've set a new standard, we should be looking at at it from that angle and then thinking about, okay, what are the problems, issues, or obstacles that are in our way? And what can we do to alleviate those or remove those so that it's not an issue? So here's a challenge for you. Uh, this is a link to the video that I showed you earlier. What I would challenge you to do is to show this video to your team members and ask them that same question that you have at the very end of the video. And that is, what is the problem? And then use that as an opportunity to have a conversation about problem solving and how people initially perceive problems and help them understand the importance of first identifying the problem before moving to potential causes or countermeasures or some other part of the problem solving process. 
if they slow it down, they'll be way more successful. So last but not least, if you'd like to learn more about Toyota's uh, TBP problem solving eight step process, here's my contact information on the left hand side, my phone, my email and my website. Uh, my latest book, The Language of Leadership, Nicer Bark, No Bite. If you would like to see some sample chapters of that, you can go to nicerbarknobite.com. And below the picture of the book, you'll see a tab or a button that says uh, free, uh, free sample. And you're welcome to download that and read through that and see what you think. Thanks. Uh, are you there, Skylar? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, you can't see me though. That's okay. okay. There you are. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for facilitating today, Daniel. And thank you to everybody who participated in today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you all again. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Daniel. Bye-bye.